This is Robert Dempsey of Atlantic Dominion Solutions. He's going to talk about cloud computing. Thank you, Jeremy. OK, so I want to start out here uh, real quick with a little video. Let's see if I can make a play. I can't take any credit for that. Uh, I've got a friend of mine that does some video production. I'm like, dude, I need something to intro, and so that's what he gave me. So, very happy. So, yep, I'm going to talk about uh, leveraging the cloud with Ruby. So, as you can see, right, this is how I normally dress every day, literally, um, when I'm working. This is my secret agent uh, suit that I wear when I'm infiltrating the enterprise and getting Ruby and Ruby on Rails in there. So again, uh, just some quick credentials on me. I'm the CEO of Atlanta Dominion Solutions. We are a web development firm in Orlando, Florida. We specialize in Ruby on Rails, and we're also getting heavily into Flex. I'm the founder of Rails for All, which is a not-for-profit. Uh, and through that, we do things like Axis Conference, which is a little two-day uh, Ruby on Rails conference down in Orlando. It's going to be the second one will be in uh, February. I'm also the co-chair of Dotarati, which is a uh, local tech um, thing. I got a BA in computer science from Rollins. I'm doing an MBA right now. And CSM stands for Certified Scrum Master. We do Agile. And uh, specifically, Scrum is what we use as our development methodology. And so uh, next week, I'm going through Certified Scrum Master training. So I'm angry. I'm like mad cow angry. Because if I hear this one more time, there's going to be some major trouble. And Jason knows all about that. He actually angered me very much this morning by saying that. So um, you know, Ruby on Rails can scale if you understand how to scale it, in my opinion. So what do we have to understand in order to get there? Well, there's all this. Um, or there's a much more simplified uh, version of really how the MVC architecture of Rails works. So already you're probably wondering you know, what the hell that has to do with Ruby and cloud computing you know, when I'm talking about Rails. Well, as we all know, if you really want to build some serious Rails apps, you have to know what you're doing with Ruby, hence Ruby on Rails. And where cloud computing can come in with web-based applications is two parts. It's, the, it's at the web server level, and it's also at the database as well. So when I think of cloud computing, I think that you know, I don't want to have to buy anything. I don't want to have to think about resources when I'm setting up, like servers or storage. And I want to be able to easily scale my application. So, you know, what exactly is scalability? And people like to define it as the ability to either handle growing amounts of work in a graceful manner or be readily enlarged in the sense of an application. Um, or it can refer to the capability of a system to basically handle a lot more traffic uh, as needed. And I can see I'm working a tough crowd this morning. So. Um, so really, I'd like to add to that, though, to that definition of scalability. And basically, it's you know, an application and the resources it uses grow as demand increases. And this is where cloud computing really comes in. So. To get something up on the cloud and basically be you know, all cloud enabled and all that good stuff, what I need is I need servers, I need storage, I need access to other utilities, I need to do it all without buying anything up front. In other words, you know, I don't have to provision servers and all that kind of thing. I want to do it all with Ruby, obviously. And that, in a nutshell, really, is the cloud. So before we get to what the cloud exactly is, because there's a lot of definitions out there too, I want to talk about what we had before we got to the cloud itself. So in the beginning, there were clusters. And there were a couple of kinds of clusters, uh, high availability and load balancing clusters. And there was also grid computing. 
So a high availability, a high availability cluster uh, looks like this. Basically, you have you know the internet up there at the top. You have a router. You got some web servers that basically talk to each other uh, via a heartbeat. So if one fails, then the other one just picks up. Then behind that, you have some data. Now a load balancing cluster is a little bit different because you have a firewall up front and then you have actually load balancers that send the traffic back to the web server. So the load balancers know what's behind it. So if a web server dies, then the load balancers will know that. And then they'll just route the traffic appropriately. And the grid was the next level up and even closer to today's cloud computing where basically you're out there somewhere and you can access all of these resources that are literally all over the place. So you could have a cluster of servers that you have access to, some amorphous stuff over here, uh, some data somewhere else, documents, applications. They're basically very loosely coupled and all over the place. So what's not a cloud? It's not a cloud if you can't buy it on your personal credit card, if they're trying to sell you hardware, if there's no API, if you need to re-architect your systems for it, definitely not a cloud. If it takes more than 10 minutes to provision, i.e., if I can't launch a server in less than 10 minutes on demand, then that's not really cloud computing. And if you have to specify the number of machines you want up front, again, mention that. And if you own all the hardware. So the next kind of thing, though, before the cloud even that's out there is something called utility computing, which a lot of people will confuse utility computing with cloud computing. And what utility computing is, is basically compute resources packaged as a utility. It can use clusters and grids. It's a pay-as-you-go model. And some examples of actual utility computing are like Amazon's web services, uh, EC2, S3, which y'all might be familiar with. HP has some stuff. Sun Microsystems has uh, network.com, and you can do stuff with that too. So. Ultimately, though, what cloud computing really is, is is basically a way to increase uh, capacity and capability on the fly without having to invest up front or licensing anything also. So the cloud is really all-encompassing. The cloud is, I mean, it's utility computing, it's software as a service, so even like Google Docs could be considered cloud computing in a sense, because again, you don't own anything. Uh, with that, they store everything. God knows where they store it. I'm assuming you know in some data center. Uh, but really, I don't have to worry about any of the resources that go into actually making Google Docs happen. Hence, software as a service itself is even uh, defined under the umbrella that cloud computing is. Web services in a cloud, uh, platform as a service, managed service providers, I was kind of interesting to see, or interested to see. Uh, service, commerce platforms, and even internet integration, which are basically, uh, there's only a few big guys out there that are trying to like, make it so you can easily uh, attach to all of these kind of uh, resources that are out there. So why is cloud computing in general important? Obviously, it's a big buzzword that's going around these days. But Forrester, or sorry, Gartner rather, uh, projects that uh, by 2011, uh, IT f departments are really going to start basically outsourcing a lot of their infrastructure. Uh, and so they're going to look to services like cloud type services uh, to do that. Uh, already people are doing that with things like Amazon's uh, EC2 and S3. So for instance, I could launch you know, a, a ginormous compute cluster on EC2 without having to invest anything up front. I can do my jobs up there, and then after it's done, kill it off. So the advantages of cloud computing are there's no hardware to buy, which is great, especially for startups when you have to keep, your, uh, you know, keep costs down. There's no infrastructure to support, which is great. I'm a Microsoft certified systems engineer. I did IT administration for years, and there's a reason I got out of it, and I'm you know, programming, and that's to not have to do that. And you can add capability also with minimal coding, which we'll see. It's actually um, almost ridiculously easy to take advantage of a lot of services out there with Ruby. So what we're going to get into next, we're going to talk about options and pricing. I put out uh, on our blog um, and said, hey, you know, what do you all want to hear about? And I think uh, 
Greg uh, from Rails Envy there said, I'd like to see some options and pricing, you know, what's out there. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to show a standard EC2 deployment because another person commented on the blog that they said, you know, so I hear EC2 is so inexpensive, um, but then, you know, I hear it's, it's, you know, in reality, it's not really all that inexpensive. And the reality is it's not cheap. Uh, because of how you have to architect an app that's running on EC2. So we'll show what a standard EC2 deployment looks like. I'll give some recommendations. We're going to look at some code and then uh, just wrap it up. So what do we have to work with uh, with cloud computing? Obviously, uh, probably a lot of y'all already know about Amazon Web Services. Uh, there's another provider called uh, Morph, which is into the realm of platform as a service. WriteScale, uh, which Greg had mentioned, uh, and well, I'll get into exactly what WriteScale does. There's Heroku, which you all might be familiar with. Uh, Joint has their accelerator products, and Engine Yard is working on Vertebra, which is a vertebrae or why not? But either way, it's coming soon, and I don't know about that, so we won't talk about that one. Um, but then do-it-yourself clouds, as Greg had mentioned, Pool Party. There's another service called Scalar, which is really cool. There's Elastic Rails, and then there's probably a lesser known one called uh, Weo CEO. So with Amazon, you have Amazon EC2, which is their compute uh, on demand. It can run anywhere from 10 cents to 80 cents per compute hour for an instance, uh, depending on the size of the server that you want. So the smaller instances, which have like uh, 1.7 gigs of RAM and a processor go for 10 cents, but if you want some mammoth, uh, ginormous server, it's gonna cost you about 80 cents per hour, plus transfer costs, uh, which they measure in gigabytes. So you pay for the instance, and you pay for transfer uh, in and out, unless you're working with Amazon's S3. So if you have data stored on S3, and you're serving it up via EC2, there's no transfer cost there. S3 is 15 cents per gigabyte, plus again, transfer costs. So if you use S3 purely for storage, uh, then they're gonna hit you up for some transfer costs there as well. Then there's Amazon SQS, which is basically a penny for 10,000 requests, again, plus transfer costs. Uh, so Greg had mentioned uh, Starling. Uh, we have uh, one of our sites, What's Up in Ruby, that uses Starling to basically tear through blogs, and we use SQS for the part of the messaging backend. And then there's Amazon Simple DB, which is 14 cents per machine hour, plus $1.50 uh, per gigabyte per month of persistent storage, plus transfer costs. So the pros of Amazon Web Services, obviously, you, know, you can pay as you go. Uh, you can use one or many, i.e. I can launch one instance or I can launch up to 20. I think if you actually need more than 20, you have to call them and ask for permission so that they know you're not trying to, like, uh, denial of service anybody all of a sudden because you could easily do it uh, with Amazon. Um, not that I would know anything, but, you know, anyway. Uh, so there's no infrastructure purchases, which is great. So basically I have, you know, at my fingertips practically unlimited uh, compute capability without having to buy anything. And then there's also a lot of third-party service providers that actually have services uh, on top of Amazon services. So the biggest con to Amazon is that you have to build reliability yourself. So if y'all have uh, read any about you know, how Google does some of their operations, they basically have like three copies of everything. Um, and it's almost the same kind of thing with Amazon Web Services, where we have had instances on EC2 vaporize when we try and reboot them. So if that is your only server, then you're going to be screwed. So you have to build reliability on top of something that is somewhat unreliable. Also, there's, there is a <clears throat> excuse me, configuration overhead with EC2. Now, the third-party service providers come in to giving you a lot of management tools for EC2. Um, otherwise, you can do it all via command line, but I like a nice little GUI that allows me to manage everything myself. So the next one is Morph, and they're somewhat newer on the scene. And also, uh, I got to give a little disclaimer. We're actually a partner with Morph, and we're a partner with uh, RightScale. But that's not necessarily why they were included in the presentation, but... So they're here. So anyway, so Morph starts at, they have a developer version 
which is uh, really cool. So basically, I can, within about five, 10 minutes, I can get a database set up, I can pull down a, a custom Capistrano file that they give you, then I can basically deploy my app onto Morph. So we have three sites up and running uh, on Morph. They used to support only Postgres as a backend database, and they now support uh, MySQL as well. And one of the cool things with Morph is that I don't have to deal with like the management really of anything. I deploy it up there. If I start with my developer version, I can check to make sure that uh, you know everything's working great. I say okay. Let me go to a paid version, which then will put my app across two servers. And so there's uh, you know there's a lot of reliability built in, and then it goes up from there. Now one of the things though that I was trying to make sure that I understood with Morph was when they say, okay, you have this duo and you have these two cubes. I'm like, okay, great. Well, you know, what's that mean? How many, and one of the things that we obviously deal with a lot, uh, at least with Rails apps is mongrel. Okay, well, how many mongrels do I get? So how much traffic do I know I can handle? Uh, so basically they said like the duo is like one mongrel on two machines and then it goes up from there, but they never put more than 12 mongrels running on a single instance of EC2. So the pros are you pay as you go. It takes about 10 minutes to sign up and launch. And there's like basically like zero configuration. It's automated uh, migration running and all that good stuff. One click scaling. So literally I can click a drop down and say, okay, I want to go from duo to whatever the next level is. And in about five minutes, my app will then be deployed instead of onto two machines onto four and so on and so forth. It takes about five minutes. They fully manage uh, everything, and they actually have hardware load balancers that everything runs through, and they back up all of it for you. And you can restore backups, and um, they we actually had to do that once, and uh, their support is really good. And then again, migrations run on deploy, so you don't have to worry about you know, making sure that your migrations ran. Um, the cons, though, is that there's no SSH or file level access. So if you don't care about that, then Morph is great. If you do care about that, then you don't want to go with Morph. So the next people again are WriteScale, uh, which is really one of the more premium offerings for EC2. And they, I'd say they are almost like the Cadillac of EC2 management tools. There are so many options that you can use with WriteScale. It's not even funny and it takes a little bit. It took us about a week to really get a full grasp of what you can do with it. Uh, but they're, they have a couple different offerings. Their right site um, edition is 2500 setup and then $500 a month and then plus EC2 costs uh, and S3 or anything that Amazon would charge you is on top of those numbers. Uh, so for instance, with Morph, where you're paying 30 bucks a month, you're just paying 30 bucks a month. You don't have to pay for EC2 and all this unless you use S3. They have right grid, which is more of their, their product that offers scaling on demand. Uh, so this is where actually starting to get into the realm of actual true scaling on demand. You can set limits and say, okay, if my CPU goes up to like 80 or 90, uh, you know, or it gets pegged, then start scaling out my app. Of course, that can be dangerous too, because if you have no limitations uh, on it, uh, for instance, like when we're chewing through blogs with what's up in Ruby, it pegs the processor. So if you had, if you said, okay, if you have no limitation, and you say, if my processor gets to 100, fire up another instance. Well, every instance we fire up and start doing work on, the processor gets pegged. So basically, we'd have an instance launch for every blog, so you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. Then there's the premium edition where you get like everything. And it's uh, $2,500 set up again and $750 a month. And then, of course, like I said, there's AWS fees on top of all of that. Uh, so they're more of the, the premium people. So the pros, there's a multitude of configuration options. Literally, we have clients deployed on WriteScale where we can launch a multi-server deployment with a click of a button. Because once you have it set up, we can launch a full deployment, which a standard deployment for WriteScale used to be um, two front ends and two back ends. So we can launch all of that at one time. It'll install any software that you need and whatnot. So it's really also platform agnostic. A scale on demand capability with their right grid product or their premium offering. Uh, one click again, multi server deployments. And you can manage everything AWS from, single, from a single interface. Now, the cool thing is, they also have a free developer version. So if you just want to be able to manage stuff on an EC2 without, or S3 or SQS, you want to see all that in a graphical manner without actually having to pay anything, uh, then you can use that. Now that's on video, so they've seen that I probably said that. So that's great. 
Um, cons is it is a bit expensive, so it is more of a premium offering, and there's a lot of upfront configuration that is required, but once you have it up and going, then you're good to go. And it is dead easy to support EC2 deployments. So the next people are Heroku, uh, which um, from what I gathered from their website and from their interview on the Ruby on Rails podcast, uh, right now it's free uh, for now. Later, they're gonna charge somehow based on work or something like that, and I've asked them uh, because I had seen that they said that they would be here, but then I heard they might not be here, but if they are here, then track them down and ask them you know, what they're gonna be charging people later because they definitely have intentions for it. So the pros of Heroku are you can do everything in a browser. Like literally, they have the code editor, you know, the whole nine yards uh, in a browser. They have automatic scaling. Now, I couldn't find really any documentation on how exactly that works, but they say that, that they have thresholds and everything already set in their software that says, you know, if it gets to a certain level of traffic, then start scaling out that application. Also, one of the cooler new things that they have is that you can work locally, then deploy. As I have never actually, I mean, I tried using a code editor in a browser, but I'm not a big fan of that. So you can, what's cool is though, is that you can do all your work locally, send it up to Heroku, and then it'll run all the, it'll do auto running of migrations and the whole nine yard and deploy your app for you and all of it. So that's a really cool new feature that they have. The cons right now, are you have to use like a heroku.com domain, as far as I know. If anyone knows different, I couldn't find anything else on their website saying anything different. So basically I'd have like robdempsey.heroku.com, um, which for you know a business face is, you know, I want my own domain name and I want to say like robdempsey.com because that looks a lot better. And also choices are made for you. So much like in Rails where it's opinionated and it says, okay, we're gonna do this they do the same kind of thing. They've made choices for you so that it's easy to deploy, but you don't have as much flexibility. So the next one is Joint Accelerator, which is more of a traditional, um, traditional hosting company. If you're familiar with Joint, their offerings basically start at 75 a month and go up to 250 and on. Now the pros are is that you pay as you go, obviously, so you start out with like a VPS, that's great, and then if you want another VPS, okay, that's great. Uh, they have solid hardware, they use a lot of Sun stuff, which is notoriously good. And from what I was told by some of their internal guys, they use ZFS, which is a function of Open Solaris, where if you need more storage, they can give you more storage. Now the cons are that you have to call in to scale your application. So um, in my opinion, that goes kind of down to the bottom where that's not really cloud computing. Because if I have to call somebody and say, hey, scale my app up, then uh, from the definitions that we had before, that's not cloud computing. Um, and also, Open Solaris is fun to try and configure and get running and work with in general. But I won't go off on that at all. So into the do-it-yourself ones, uh, Pool Party, as Greg had mentioned, is free. It's a Ruby gem. Uh, so you obviously don't have to pay for that, but you do have to pay for AWS costs. Pros are easily or easy configuration and deployment. Uh, from seeing their screencast, it looked pretty easy, and you can highly configure your EC2 instances, so it gives you all the, the flexibility of installing software and all that good stuff. Uh, the cons are I found it really lacking in documentation, and when I went into their IRC and actually posted a, a comment on their, um, their Google group and said, hey, does anybody have experience working with like Rails apps on Pool Party? I got zero answer and I couldn't find really any documentation. So if anyone knows where it is, please let me know. Uh, right now it supports only Ubuntu, uh, EC2, uh, AMIs, which are Amazon machine instances, which for me really isn't a problem because I love Ubuntu as a server, but I know like RightScale uses for their standard, they'll use CentOS, um, or some people want to use actually like Red Hat Enterprise if you're paying for it. Uh, so with this, you only get Ubuntu. And from what they said uh, in their, like on their site, it's not production ready. And that, um, just to qualify that, they said that around June 20th. So if it is now, I'd, they haven't said. So next up is Scalar, which was created by uh, Intridia, which is another web development firm. Uh, Scalar itself, you can get for free. Uh, from Google code, you can download all the code and host it yourself. And then, of course, you're just paying for Amazon Web Services, again, the costs. Or they have a paid version, which is $50 a month, 
plus Amazon Web Services, uh, which is really cool. You can go in, they have a screencast of how it works. You can set like min and max thresholds. So you can say, okay, you know, if I start, um, you know, my app starts getting a huge amount of traffic, scale it, but only use, like only fire up two more instances tops. So they put a threshold on it so you don't get this like multi-thousand dollar bill from uh, Amazon at the end of the month. You're like, holy shit, you know, what is that? So pretty cool. Um, pros, obviously, is free for the code base, always nice. You can configure auto scaling of literally everything. And I had a lot of talks with uh, Dave Nafis from Intridia and what he told me is it'll also scale the backend databases and they have just a few like lines of code change to be able to deal with that also in your Rails app uh, when you know, all of a sudden you have one database and all of a sudden you have multiple ones. Uh, it can handle that. And it's configurable to do automatic database backups to S3, which is nice because one of the things I sometimes forget in the very beginning is, okay, great, I've got my app up and going. Um, oh yeah, I gotta back it up, you know, just in case, God forbid, anything happens. Or my EC2 instances, vaporize when I have to reboot them, which they do. So the cons are you have to use uh, their base AMI. Uh, so you're eh, not really, um, not too many options there with that. But that was really the only con I could find of that one. The next one is this thing called Elastic Rails. And there's a, a free community edition, which you can use, again, plus the Amazon Web Services charges. Uh, no one really is going to foot the bill for that one. Uh, then they have a $10 a month personal edition, which allows you to manage uh, ones you build, which kind of gets into the pros of uh, basically you go and they have this tool online where you can literally build your image. So they have, um, they say, okay, I want to build uh, an AMI that has Rails. Okay, great. And I, you know, it has this version of Rails and this version of Ruby. And I want to use either Nginx or they now support um, Apache with Passenger, which is really cool. So they'll support that one also. And so you build up basically, you say, okay, I want these Ruby gems and whatnot. It'll build it all up for you. And then you can spit it out as either a, a VM uh, for like VMware, or I think they also support Parallels, or you can launch that sucker on an EC2 when you're done, which is pretty cool. So you, know, you build this custom bundle and deploy it, and there's this GUI management console that lets you manage um, like all of the, the servers that you've built. Now the cons are really that Elastic Server equals application stack. It's not actually, again, cloud computing. You can launch it over there, but then you still have to deal with everything really after that. Uh, the community edition is for non-commercial use. So they actually license it and they say, okay, if you're using the free version, that's great, but you can't use it for business, which sucks. So the next one also is that Rails 2.0.2 uh, is the latest version of Rails that they support, and I like to use the newest stuff. But that's just me. So Weo CEO is, um, I believe it's the last one. It's free, again, um, plus the AWS costs. Cool things about them, they have actually automatic load balancing built into the software. They have automatic scaling. And much like with Scalar, you can set mins and maxes. So you say, okay, I need a minimum of two front ends, but if I have to start scaling that sucker, you know, then don't go over four front ends. So you don't get, again, whacked with some insane EC2 bill. The cons, well, this is a con for me, is command line setup. I, mean, I work a lot in the command line, but I don't want to have to manage like full deployments of servers and stuff via a command line, which right now you do for them. Um, and there's no specific documentation on using Rails. Like at all, there's no documentation. So what's the standard EC2 deployment look like and why is it really so expensive to use it? Well, this is what one actually looks like if you want to have something where if a server vaporizes, you're not uh, SOL. So again, you start at the top of the firewall, which we'll just let uh, Amazon handle that one. You need at least two load balancers, like actual machines running only as load balancers. Then behind that, you have at least two web servers. So if one goes down, you're not, uh, you know, you didn't screw the pooch with that one. And for a database, you have a master and slave database. So if your master database goes down, promote the slave, fire up another one, get replication going again, and keep going. So you need a minimum of six servers running on EC2 for full uh, reliability. So how much does that cost? Well, if you have two load balancers, it's say the small instance, which is, again, it's 10 cents uh, per compute hour, so $2.40 a day. If we figure that an average month has 30 days, then your two load balancers are gonna cost you 144 bucks. 
your web servers are gonna cost you 144 bucks, and your database servers are gonna cost you 144 bucks. So, a standard EC2 deployment will cost us $432 a month, and that's only for the instances themselves. That's no S3, that's no SQS, that's no making sure your stuff is backed up somewhere, you know, because again, God forbid, nothing. So that's like the base cost is about 432 bucks. So what do I recommend? Well, the question is, are you a developer or are you a systems administrator? Again, I did systems administration and I don't want to do it anymore. So I choose developer on that one. So my suggestion is pay for it. You know, pay a little bit of money for some of these options and get full management tools of everything. It makes your life so much easier. And the costs for a lot of it are really low. So you can start off with, in this order I would say, you can start off with Morph, where you start around, you know, again, like $30 a month. Next up, I'd go for Scalar. And then after that, if you have a bigger budget and you need to handle some like serious configuration of stuff, uh, then RightScale is the way to go with that. So finally, let's look at some code of using all this stuff. So first some books. Uh, some books that I would recommend, uh, Programming Amazon Web Services, which I uh, gave a copy to Jeremy, which he'll be giving away. Uh, RESTful Web Services is another great book because a lot, again, all of these, the APIs for a lot of these services are REST based. And then uh, Ben Schofield did a little one called Practical REST on Rails 2 Projects, which is also good. I will warn you though that programming Amazon Web Services literally like does, you do everything yourself, just so you know, instead of using gems. Also, uh, just another shameless little plug of myself, um, a Amazon Web Services articles. Uh, I did one on introduction to AWS for Ruby developers, economical use of S3, blah, blah, blah. And then the full Monty, which is using Amazon S3, EC2, SQS, Lucene, and Ruby for web spidering, in which we use stuff like uh, HPercot to pull down pages and rip them apart. And then there's another one for Amazon's uh, flexible payment service. Uh, which is called Sample Applications in Ruby uh, for Amazon FPS. And the reason I didn't really mention FPS uh, in my talk was that I think there's one project out there uh, run by a guy named Tyler Hunt that actually has anything built to tie in, like in Ruby, to tie in with uh, FPS, so there's no real gems or anything available to make it easy. So, some gems that we can use, however, um, I suggest the right scale gems, because you have like two gems and they do everything and they are awesome and we'll see how to use those in a second you can deal with ec2 s3 sqs and simple db all from one ruby gem which is awesome and then it depends on this thing called write http connection uh, remit is the the project again for dealing with uh, amazon's flexible payment service and then pool party is available as a gem as well some plugins, uh, if you're into Rails, that you can use for S3. Uh, Paperclip is a great one for attachments. There's also Attachment Foo, which was kind of like the standard. And then there's also Backup Foo, which makes backups of MySQL to S3 dead easy. Uh, for Simple DB, uh, you can use this one called AWS SDB Proxy. And then for SQS, there's uh, Active Messaging, which is a plugin as well. So if you want to use Paperclip with S3, then basically use these two gems right here. Write AWS and write HTTP connection. Oh, and by the way, these slides, I've already actually posted them online and I will post that everyone can see all the slides, so don't worry about like, typing up code real quick. And the documentation for all this stuff is also really good. So to use uh, Paperclip, it's really easy. Say you have this product model here. All you have to do is say, okay, has attached file, and you basically say you know, what you want. Okay, so I'm gonna call it a photo. I need some styles for it. I wanna uh, store it in S3. Here are my S3 credentials kept in another file, secret. Uh, here's the path where I want it stored, and there's my bucket on S3 in which it'll go. So very easy, and literally that's it. And so then once you put your file upload and make your form, uh, handle uploads, then you're good to go. And then it's, it's dead easy. For SQS, you can use a gem called SQS. And this is using that one. In your config uh, environment.rb, if you're using Rails, then you just require Ruby gems, require SQS, put in your credentials for Amazon, and then say you have a, a job model, and then to get a queue, basically it's queue equals 
sqs.getq and give me the name of the queue itself. You can send a message really easy, just dot send message and then the whatever the, uh, you know, the message is that you want to send. You can easily receive messages, dot receive message again, easy. And then you can delete a job from a queue, again, just as easy. And this stuff really is, it's awesome. So using the right AWS gem is almost even easier. So if you use the right AWS and the right HTTP connection gems, then to create a queue, then you just do that first line of code. I'm not going to read all this because that'd be really boring. Um, Basically, you just gen a new SQS queue, give it your uh, Amazon credentials, and then you say, okay, you know, my queue is now named my awesome queue. Done. And then you have a queue up on SQS to sit in there waiting for your good stuff. So if you want to create another one, you do the same kind of thing. And that true there on the end um, is for actually something, uh, you can set a flag for visible. So you can actually have stuff in the queue that's visible or invisible, which is really interesting. Uh, and then Basically, to use the gem, if you want to see how many items are in it, you just do Q2 that size, and it'll tell you how big your queue is at the time. So to pull a message from the queue and make it invisible, uh, for some reason, if you want it an invisible message, basically you just say, okay, you know, create an object, message one, say I receive from my queue, set the visibility, uh, visibility is zero, and then that's pretty much it. You're done. So if you want to clear it, uh, add a message, delete the first accessible message in there, uh, three lines of code. Again, Ruby makes it extremely easy. So if you want to use SimpleDB, uh, which is, uh, is anybody using SimpleDB for anything? No? Okay, yeah. It's kind of weird. It's for storing like unstructured data. So much like, uh, I guess like Google's Big table, I think it is, where basically they determine, yeah, you know, what is like, what are my, you know, rows or what? It's basically like uh, key value pairs is what is storing on SimpleDB. So if you want to use SimpleDB for anything, like some intermediary, uh, say, um, again, very easy. Fire up, uh, you know, create the interface, give it some credentials, uh, protocol HTTPS if you want to keep it hidden or uh, you know you don't mind someone hacking your data when you're pulling it down. That's fine. Um, and then you can say uh, if you want to log rate as well. So with SimpleDB, you have these things called domains, which is where everything's stored. So to create one, again, once you have your SDB object, create domain, give it a name, done. If you want to delete it, same kind of thing. One line, done. Uh, if you want to create and save attributes for, say, John and Sylvia, like, okay, you know, uh, create this thing for John. I'm going to give them car and beer. I'm going to do the same kind of thing for Sylvia. You put your attributes, you get, and um, again, then you're done. Very easy to deal with simple DB. Now, if you actually want to pull something out of there, once you put it there, uh, get attributes. Again, very easy. If you want to get attributes only for one thing that's in there, then you can specify that there at the end where it says uh, cat. You're saying, okay, for this cat object that's out there, give me only the attributes for that one. You can query uh, simple DB. And you can also query it and say, okay, give me a limit of actually the, the first 10 items that you find. So you can query it almost like a relational database, but you know, not quite. Not as cool, all the stuff. Okay, so that took a lot less time than I thought it would, uh, which is good, I guess, since we're going to lunch pretty soon anyway. Um, so ultimately, yeah, the... Um, Cloud computing for scaling apps of any sort is really the missing piece of the puzzle. And again, Ruby makes it like dead, dead simple to use. So thank you very much uh, for your time and coming to the hoedown. Thank you, Jeremy, for inviting me here to talk to you fine people this morning. Uh, so thank you. And here's me everywhere online. So are there any Questions? Yes, sir. Um, so the biggest problem we've run into with cloud computing, especially EC2, is mail. Um, because the EC2 instances are on a known dynamic, uh, uh, known dynamic IP range. So pretty much everything that gets sent from an EC2 instance proper gets sent right to, uh, right to junk mail. Okay. So it's a, you know, it's a problem for basically all these. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's uh, not. Yeah. <laughs> It's endemic. Uh, 
curious if you have a, a found a solution for your uh, apps that you host on EC2 instances. Gotcha. Yeah. So the so the thing is is that sending out email from EC2 instances goes to spam. And yes, we've had that problem a hell of a lot, and it's annoying. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is have you guys used um, the uh, what is it Elastic IPs? Where basically you give it the IP and then you create an SPF record in you know, and it still goes to spam. Because I know like things like Yahoo and MSN, there's been nothing that we can do. We just have to tell people, like when they sign up on the sign up page and say, hey, add this email address uh, to, um, you know, to your contact so it won't go to spam. Otherwise, we've actually uh, used like Gmail for an SMTP server, uh, if you will. And so that's how we get around that a lot of times. We just like, you know, send it through Google. Uh, insight. Unfortunately, no. We're, yeah, spam dealing with that is like a never ending battle. Yep. I mean, we're using Google Apps for your domain. Um, and right on. there's a couple of, uh, I think, SFTP auth or uh, a couple of different auth, uh, auth SMTP. Okay. Auth uh, SMTP? Yeah. So it's an outsourced SMTP server. So you can delegate to them, and they're really good at getting through. Right on. Wait, so auth SMTP. Yeah, it's, it's going to add to the cost a little bit, but. Right on. Um, it will get your mail delivered. Is that how expensive is that? Do you know? Yeah. Depends on how many emails you're sending. Okay. So one of the one of the biggest plans is like one fifty a year or something. Hundred fifty bucks a year? It's incredible. Maybe. Okay. Not too bad. Any other questions? Where are the slides? The slides yeah. um, will be posted um, on my blog okay. or our blog uh, as soon as I get out of here. But they're on slideshare.net. If you type like cloud computing, Ruby stuff like that, they're up there. Uh, so you have them. All right, well thank you very much and have a good lunch and I'll see y'all later. <laughs>